Oh, good day everyone at home. Uh, today we've got uh, Tracy Howie on the line, traditional custodian of the, the Central Coast here and, and Northern Sydney, I understand, right through to um, Lake Macquarie. Is that right, Trace? Uh, yeah, that's right, Jason. Yeah. Oh, it's great to have you here and I, I really look forward to sharing uh, some of your story uh, with uh, some Central Coast residents, particularly some people that, that are very, very interested and would like to know a bit more about uh, local Central Coast history and and who are indeed the traditional custodians of the land here on the Central Coast. Would you mind giving us a bit of an outline, please? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm a direct descendant of uh, Bulgari and Matra. Um, Matra is uh, from Lake Macquarie. Uh, she's of the Wolpanolama. Um, and Bulgari, of course, uh, he was a Garrigal fella from down around the Tonka area, uh, Broken Bay area. And uh, he, he was really well known for surfing navigating with Matthew Flinders and then um, there were 14 other uh, maritime navigations that he was part of as well. So was uh, Bungaree made the chest plate king of the Broken Bay tribe? I know the chest plate wasn't a traditional Aboriginal thing, but would I be right in saying that? Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it wasn't uh, yeah, a, a traditional adornment. Uh, Nor is, is the title of king, um, you know, a, a, a traditional title. Um, but yeah, he, he was given that breastplate. He, he was given several breast, breastplates. Uh, he was given uh, King of the Broken Bay. Uh, he was given King of the Sydney Blacks. Um, he, there were several. I, I'm quite sure there was about 12 in total that he was given. Oh, wow. And circumnavigated Australia twice with Matthew Flinders and his cat, his, his famous cat. Apparently they've got, well, I've seen the statue to Matthew Flinders uh, up on uh, Mount, Rum Mount Rumbalara. No, no statue of Bungaree, unfortunately. And I've heard there's also a statue of his cat. Uh, yeah, down outside um, the, uh, I'm pretty sure it's out the front of the museum um, down in Sydney. It's either the museum or the Mitchell Library in Sydney. There's a full scale um, replica, you know, statue of Matthew Flinders and, and his uh, cat Trim sitting on the windowsill. And yeah, sadly, just as like at Rumbalara, there's no statue of Bungaree. We'll have, we'll have to work on that one. We'll have to work on our, our local council or state government, whoever's done that, to make sure that uh, there's a bit more balance created there because I've, I've read and I've heard that the trip would have been uh, not made possible if it wasn't for, for Bungaree at the time. Yeah, well, I mean, Flinders journals are even um, available online. Certain extracts of those journals are available online. And, it, yeah, from the stories that I've heard um, from, you know, his uh, family uh, and descendants and things um, like that, and, of course, through the Matthew Flinders um, uh, Society, they speak very highly uh, of Bungaree and of the contribution that he made uh, to those journeys. And, um, you know, if it wasn't for them, uh, for him, sorry, being on board, um, there was a, a, a several occasions where the crew would have, you know, died of starvation or uh, lack of water. Um, and, I mean, not only that, there was also a few very momentous historical events that happened throughout that journey um, that are, you know, part of uh, a, an exchange of culture through uh, Aboriginal um, tribes from different states, you know, from different parts of the country. So uh, I do know that Bungaroo, when they uh, docked in Yolongu land up the top of top end of Australia, um, uh, Yungaree went um, hunting with um, the Yolongu people along with some of the crew members and uh, Flint has documented in his journal that um, Yungaree noticed that they only hand propelled their spears up there and so he sat with them and taught them how to make and how to use a woomera, um, which is a tool that we use down here in New South Wales which actually enables your spear to be propelled be propelled up to 10 times faster than had you just hand thrown it. Trace, can you just um, describe so the, the spear thrower, which is another name which cultures around the world have used actually just for people at home who might not have any idea what a woomera is? Yeah, sure, sure. It's usually, it, well, it's always been crafted out of a, a, a piece of, um, a, of na uh, native wood, of course, usually the xantharia, um, which is the same material which your um, spear itself's made out of. And it, it's a, a short, it can either be um, cylinder or um, heat treated and, and then flattened. Um, and it, on the end of it, it has a return on it, which kind of looks what we would recognise today as a Nike tick. And that little return 
would either be made out of an animal too, um, perhaps a, a bit of bone, um, or if you were a really handy craftsman, you would be able to handcraft yourself that return out of the material that you're making your warmer out of. And that little return is what the end of your spear sits in. So with those two held in your hand and using the force of the warmer of throwing the spear, it of course, as I said, throws your spear up to 10 times further than had it been hand propelled. They use it traditionally up there in the top end now? Uh, I'm not quite sure if yep. the tradition has carried on. Um, I would really love to go up there and visit and see if it has. Oh, that would be amazing. Um, but I, I would not be surprised um, if it has because uh, Flinders did you know, also document in those journals that they were um, so you know, grateful for what he had um, shown them that they gifted him with a hollow log that made the most harrowing sound. Oh, wow. So, yeah, as we know, you know, the, um, you could imagine that would possibly have been the didgeridoo, uh, not being a traditional instrument here of New South Wales. Um, potentially that could have been the first didgeridoo that made its way back here to New South Wales. Imagine the experience as Bongaree and, and the crew. How many people were on the, were on the ship? I'm sure there were, uh, I know there were several hundred on the ship. I, I would not like to be quoted as to the exact number, but I do know there were several hundred on board. That's a lot of mouths to feed, isn't it? And, and what year was that? Um, they left Sydney Harbour in 1801, and I Ooh. do know that the day that they sailed back into harbour in to Sydney was the 9th of June, 1803. So pretty early days, really. I mean, you still had the wars with Pemulwuy and and Windradine and, and all those, um, I guess, uh, resistance fighters, if you like, back in the day going on at the same time that you've got Bongaree circumnavigating this continent not only once but twice. Trace, what do you think was their main objective to circumnavigate Australia? Uh, he was commissioned by the then king, um, you know, the king of England, uh, to do a map of, you know, what he considered to be his new possession. Well, that makes sense. Um, so that, yeah, he could have a conclusive map uh, of Australia because up until uh, Flinders did his map of Australia, uh, all the maps that uh, existed up until that date, uh, Tasmania was actually connected to the mainland uh, and they weren't as uh, intricate as the map that Matthew Flinders did. The, the, actual, the coordinates that were on Matthew Flinders' map in uh, 2003, we... Uh, the state government put it on a reenactment down in Sydney Harbour and they had tall ships come back into Sydney Harbour and, you know, um, there was a, a reenactment ceremony and there were a few uh, people that gave uh, key speeches at the, the main ceremony and one of those key speakers was the Rear Admiral of the Australian Navy and he stated that the coordinates that Matthew Flinders documented on his map that he did of Australia throughout that journey that he did with Bungaree were that accurate that the Australian Navy was still using those coordinates in 2003. So, you know, to, to think that, you know, that was actually the stature of the work that Matthew Flinders produced. So, you know, hence why the then King of England sent him to do the job to map what he considered to be his new continent. Well, that makes total sense. Trace, I remember a while back you told me a bit of a story about when uh, Bungaree's gone in and, and um, taken, taken weapons and, uh, from one of the Aboriginal tribes. Would you be able to tell us a little bit about that story, please? Uh, yeah, that was the beginning of the story with the Yolongu people. Uh, so when they first docked up there, uh, as you could imagine, um, the local mob up there would have been, you know, quite hesitant to accept anybody that, you know, was coming from, you know, the, the ships, who knows what impression they had of those ships and all the white fellas that were on those ships. Um, so they didn't want to have anything to do with them. Um, unfortunately, on board, they were starving at that stage and they had no water. So it was really important that Bungaree did uh, make um, some kind of relationship, some kind of connection with the local people up there. So despite the hostility that had been shown, Bungaree wanted to show to them that, yes, he was accompanying these people and 
yes, he may have, you know, obviously been helping them survive throughout this journey, but from the place that he's from, from his own country, he's a man of stature and a man of great importance. So throughout the night, Bungaree went into their camp. Um, he removed every weapon that he could see and he laid it out on sand on the beach. As soon as the sun rose, of course, the local mob, the long people knew that that would have been the visitors that had come into their camp and taken the thing, so straight out to the beach they're headed. Um, Bunkeri was standing there on the beach with his hands out in front of him with all of their weapons laid out on the sand. So with that gesture, even though they couldn't communicate on a verbal level, with that gesture of mentality and physical ability, the Yolonga people recognised that exactly that. He was a, a man of great stature, obviously no average human being uh, for that to occur and that's when they invited him in and after that of course that's when they went hunting and the story goes on. Uh, it's kind of a sign of power uh, but peace at the same time like he had the opportunity uh, to, to take them out for no use of a better term and uh, but he didn't. He was there I guess I, I don't want to you know, put words in your mouth, but I, when I envisage that, I see him looking very smug on the beach as if, look at, look, look at no, what I've I done. Do too. <laughs> yeah, do you? Okay, yeah, beauty. Yeah. <laughs> Trace. Uh, so when things happen, uh, you, you're invited to various ceremonies uh, in regards to you know Matthew Flinders, um, circumnavigation of Australia. Your connection to Bungaree and your connection. Um, to the greater Central Coast area, if I was to broaden it out a little bit, and, and Northern Sydney right through to Lake Macquarie, uh, yeah. is is never questioned. But there has been something, or would I be right in saying that? Uh, yeah, no, that's right. Yeah, um, up, uh, after the um, two thousand and three reenactment that was had down in Sydney Harbour, um, well, it, it was a, a, a few years after that. Actually, there was a, a series of years where uh, on the 9th of June. Um, I would go down and have uh, share morning tea with the, um, our previous governor of New South Wales, uh, Governor Marie Bashir. Um, and yeah, we did that on several occasions and uh, commemorated the return into Sydney Harbour. So yeah, there's definitely those things that have happened, most definitely. Trace, can you tell me a little bit more just on that point about your connection to the land? Because I do. I want to discuss with you something which has been happening lately, which is um, which is of great importance to, to you and your people. Um, can you just yep. talk about some of the some of the tribes in this area and some of the controversy in regards to the word uh, Garingai? Uh, yeah, sure. Well, uh, I mean the the um, the mobs that I've been you know brought up with um, that that family have told us about that have been passed down to us. Um, uh, Wakalawa, um, the, the, the Wenangani, Wanangain, um, and the, uh, Wanabi, the Garigal, um, and then of course down in Sydney we've got Borogigal, Taramurugal, um, and, uh, Geewegal, um, and Bidjigal. And, uh, up here on the Central Coast there's, uh, I suppose it's been quite a, a hot contention for some time now. Um, probably driven from uh, the name associated with the, the local Aboriginal Land Council that we've got here. Um, it, it's called the Darkenjung Local Aboriginal Land Council. Um, they uh, have recently um, stated that they represent um, the, the Darkenjung um, people, um, which of course, they do the the Dugan the Dugan uh, traditional people did occupy uh, certain parts of what is considered to be the Central Coast area, um, being you know the inland uh, areas of the Central Coast. So the Darking Nong were. So I trust the Darking Nong were your neighbours. Just to be clear for the people at home. Yep, most definitely. Yeah, okay. yeah, they were our neighbours. Um, and uh, uh, I mean and. We still have, you know, a tight connection with Dagenong um, blood descendants. Uh, as you could imagine, like with with any, you know, family, like you, you don't marry your own bloodline. 
Um, so Doug and Nong, um, you know, our western neighbours, um, our Wapko neighbours to the north, and our Darug neighbours um, to the, the south and the southwest. Of course, they're all part of our kinship structure and, and part of the people that um, we traditionally married into um, to, you know, of course, get away from, um, you know, at marrying into uh, relations. So um, they most definitely are a, an important part uh, of the Central Coast, as in the, the wider Central Coast. Um, just answering the second part of your question there, um, you, you know, about the um, Garengai term, it's, um, you know, I mean, that was a, a term that was, you know, given to us um, in the 1800s by uh, a fellow named Fraser, and I suppose that could probably be debated as well to whether or not he, um, you know, came up with that name or whether he you know, saw it and, and took that information from somebody else. And Fraser was um, the linguist? Um, that, that's exactly right, yeah, that's exactly right. But, I mean, the basis of, uh, of what it is made up of, um, the term Gurungai itself, uh, if you break that up into our language, it means Guri, which is man. Um, Guri, a lot of people say Guri these days, it's Guri. Guri, and Ngai is woman, um, female. So Guri and Guy. Um, they're the men and the women that call themselves Gori on and guy. So, in in a sense, that's probably why we've hung on to that term um, and felt that it had um, some authenticity, you know, about us. Um, you know, in in saying that, of course, it most definitely is not, um, you know, our traditional term. So, so it was more of a blanket. Um name i guess you know i identify as australian but if we scratch the surface just a little bit you know my father originally came from egypt and we're multicultural on that side and our mum's side comes from from convicts and we've got irish scottish english i mean it's it's never as as easy as that but i guess because you're living in a anglicized uh, society uh post-european settlement invasion so that's what the europeans use to basically name pretty much all the coastal tribes going right up north, going into the northwest, would, would that be accurate? Yeah, well, I mean, and out west as well. Like, I mean, when, like, you, the, the two biggest, you know, tribes of uh, New South Wales that, you know, were Wiradjuri and Gamilaroi, um, the Wiradjuri people, um, the, where that word derived from is because they're the people that use the word we're up for no. Um, Gomelroy, they're the people that use the word Gommel for no. Um, and then as they got into Queensland, they actually changed it to yes. So you get the Yugra people. Uh, Yug is yes in their language. So, you know, it, um, it, it is most definitely a Western concept, um, you know, or, or an anglicised concept to try and appoint um, these tribal names to people. Um, whereas we, we as Aboriginal people, like we're part of the country um, and the country is, is a part of us. So therefore, for us to be alive in this space and in this living atmosphere, we are a person of this place and time. Um, and if I'm standing in my country in, say, Broken Bay area, um, I'm still within my country, I'm still within my language group, so I would probably identify in, in today's English terms as, 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 as a variable person, whereas if I were in Taramara, I, I would definitely, you know, identify as a Taramara bull, you know, being the bull identifying the person. Um, so still within country, still within language group. And you'd be with your so family. A person of this place and time. You'd be with your family there at the time as well. So when they came up and the Europeans probably couldn't distinguish between the different tribes, they said, you know, who's, who's this group? And, and, and they that's may have right. answered the Taramadagal at the time. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. And I mean, and, and evidence was that, of that was proven on um, the blanket list distributions. Um, the, sorry, the blanket distribution list that they made um, in, in the early 1800s when rations and blankets were handed out um, and, and slops, as they called it, which were, you know, used clothing um, to the Aboriginal people. 
um, the people that they were handing them out to in, in Sydney, in northern Sydney, uh, they were also showing up on the Central Coast. <laughs> they were also showing up in Lake Quarry, uh, so, you know, to, to collect blankets and, and, and slops and, and rations and things. So, you know, the, the, there's proof there that they were all within the same, you know, family, at, at least language group. Trace, can you tell me a little bit about, uh, we have spoken uh, briefly about it, but can you tell me a little bit about uh, the situation with the, the uh, Dark Injunct Country signs? Uh, yeah, well, to my knowledge, uh, they've come about through a request from the directors of the Dark Injunct Land Council to Transport New South Wales uh, to have the Dark Injunct Country signs erected um, on, not Dark Injunct Country, um, go figure. Uh, so, yeah, that's um, the history that I know about it. And uh, with, you know, despite, you know, efforts of trying to object to those and have them removed, um, we've pretty much been told that unless we get a successful native title determination, um, we don't really even have a position at the table to take up the conversation. Can you tell us a little bit about native title for the people at home that may not be aware about it, please? Yeah, sure. Well, um, the, for native title, there's um, quite a few processes that you've got to go through. Um, and, you know, it, it is only for uh, people that are asserting connection with the, the area that they're asserting uh, descendancy from. So with um, me, of course, as I said, I'm a direct descendant of um, Bungaree Matra, um, down the line, Charlotte Ashby, um, and... You know, so of course we went through to uh, get a native title claim. Um, so you have to uh, first, of course, satisfy the registration test, uh, which is having your uh, genealogy certified that uh, qualifies you to say yes, that you are definitely a descendant of the Apical ancestors that have been identified as the early original occupants of a particular area. So we of course satisfied the registration test through the native title process uh, and the next step is then a connection report and a connection report consists of um, producing documentation and evidence uh, in relation to um, uh, cultural ceremonies and cultural connection to country, cultural use of country um, and those sorts of things. Uh, use of language, use of uh, traditional dance, song, those sorts of things. Um, so uh, once you produce, you know, sorry, once you supply those to um, the state, uh, they then decide on whether enough there is enough material to award you determination or to send you to take you to the federal court to. Um, pretty much drag out the process and try and wean out any other further information that you may have. Um, so it's an extremely costly process um, and unless you've got, uh, I would not be lying to say a million dollars in the bank account, it's probably not a venture that you should consider. So what's, what's behind uh, you being essentially blocked from claiming uh, native title, the fact that you can prove you you are a traditional custodian of the Central Coast, a direct bloodline descendant from this area. Uh, what do you think is behind the block? Um, well, I mean, despite the fact that the New South Wales state interpretation of um, the Native Title Act, uh, and I'll use the presiding judge's words over our case, primitive, uh, in comparison to other states of New South Wales, uh, if you look at the way that um, the New South Wales state government processes native title and considers native title, they really do not at all take in, in heed the Marbo Act. Um, they don't acknowledge the Marbo Act. If they did, then their processes would not be um, as, as strict as what they are. So uh, we produced um, a, a whole heap of documentation, a whole heap of evidence as far as connection to country and those sorts of things. Um, and uh, the state decided that they wanted more information and wanted to take us to federal court. So the first process in um, passing the registration test and, of course, 
you know, getting your argument to the point that you have enough information to qualify a native title, uh, a federal court case, um, is, is very close to three hundred thousand dollar mark. Um, so uh, after that, federal court. Once you go into the federal court, you're looking in excess of potentially twenty thousand dollars a day. So if you take that avenue on and you fail for whatever means that you fail, then there is no recourse for any of your family members, whether it be 200 years in the future from now or whether it be next year, there's no recourse whatsoever for future members to ever apply for native title ever again over those same areas. Um, so it's something that you really, really have to take with very, very strict consideration. And what would native title? What would native title mean to you? Oh, um, native title. Uh, a native title determination to us would mean uh, a permanent seat at the table. Uh, we would be recognised and acknowledged with uh, developers, with state government, with local government, with federal government. Um, currently at the moment, I have tried to get an appointment with our local member um, and I was simply given uh, an email reply with no on those types of matters. We will only consult with the Duncan Jung Land Council and, and Baran. Uh, so despite my bloodline ties here to the area, my proven bloodline ties here to the area, um, I can't even get an appointment with our local representative who also, mind you, happens to be the Shadow Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. Oh, okay, David Harris? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So, so my Aboriginal Affairs aren't good enough. What would, what would all this look like in an ideal world, Tracy, in regards to, um, to your native title and to what's happening with Dark and Jung Land Council in regards to the signs? I mean, would you like the signs to be taken down and have Garingai put up or would you prefer, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, that the individual tribes from those areas, names are put up, of course, there is, as you say, Darking, Darking Noongar, Darking Young, country Darking west, Noong, yeah. west west of the central, western central coast. Yeah, um, that's correct. I, I believe that the family prefer that term to be Darking Noong. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that that would be a, an ideal uh, outcome, would be in those areas where... Uh, those, you know, traditional names are known, but most definitely those are the ones that are used. And I guess, and I mean, I've got a dog in the fight in regards to, as, as you know, because we, we fought long and hard together on protecting Carryong and, and Kalga. Uh, but if you had your native title, we'd probably be in a, in a different situation here where we wouldn't have to be taking on uh, oh. Darkinjung Land Council in regards to the development that they want to do at 300 Woi Woi Road. Would, would yeah, I be fair in saying that? Yeah, we, we would be in a completely different situation. Most definitely a completely situation. And and us as a people would have been in a most definitely different situation uh, when Family and Community Services took an excavator to a known and registered burial site down at 396 Booker Bay Road, Booker Bay, where the Duck and Jung Land Council took $45,000 payout, which then, you know, left our legal fight eligible. Tracy, so are you able to tell us uh, a little bit about what's happening at 300 Woi Woi Road? So for people at home, uh, obviously there's an incredible amount of uh, Aboriginal engraving sites in the area. I don't take people there um, and we strongly say, don't suggest that people do go to those uh, places. Well, I don't anyway. Um, but for people that don't know, it's, it's near the, the famous or infamous, depending on who you speak to, Egyptian hieroglyphs and the, and the incredible grandmother tree, that giant Angophra costata there that must be at least 500 years old or much older. You've got uh, Duck and Jung Local Aboriginal Land Council uh, trying to do uh, a housing development of about 70 houses uh, right next door. Uh, I'm heavily involved in it. But Trace, what can you tell us about from, from your perspective about what's happening there? Um, well... From uh, my point of view, like, I mean, I, I understand that, you know, Aboriginal people, you know, deserve just like non-Aboriginal people to, um, you know, develop land and to get ahead in life and those sorts of things. I, 
I totally agree with that 100%. But I also rely on the fact that Aboriginal people will look after and preserve and protect land that has a significant ecological and cultural value to the local community and the local environment. So to my knowledge, um, well, uh, uh, I do know that that part of the landscape there uh, across that ridge line is part of a very unique story that is attached to um, our men, uh, which is the story of the Puttagram, the, the eastern grey kangaroo. Um, and that area there is um, incorporated into uh, that story. Um, for that area there to be developed will only uh, increase uh, negative behaviour and uh, negative um, intrusions onto the already known Aboriginal place um, that's there um, and not to mention you know animals that property owners you know have the the right to own so yeah dog dogs and cats in particular exactly, getting into the area exactly that when exactly it's full of threatened that. species yep it, that's exactly that like when, when people look at impacts um that a development will, will make a lot of the time they're only looking at the exact study area and and where the houses are going to sit and and the the footprint of that development itself but you have to consider the surrounding environment. We know ourselves when we move into a place, we don't just live within the boundaries of our four walls and, 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 and our fences. We go walking, we go exploring. Our children go walking, they go exploring at night time and throughout the day. Our animals do exactly the same thing. So to have those, that mass amount of negative impact within that area there would be so detrimental to the environment and the cultural landscape and, and irreversible. What would be the ultimate outcome in regards to that land there, that, that, that part of Carry On Sacred Lands as we've come to know it? I think that it should be made an extension of the National Park uh, that is that abuts that area there. That, that would be the ultimate. Possible and, her heritage and, listing, it, and and most definitely, as we know, you know, um, several years ago, the scientists from UNESCO came out here and they um, visited that landscape, and their response to viewing that landscape was that this sandstone and these sandstone arrangements and complexes and outcrops are of world heritage recognition, and that they should be recognised in that stature. And that's UNESCO's portfolio, World Heritage? That's exactly correct, yeah. And Trace, is it Jean, Jean Clotz, the, the Frenchman that that visited the site some time ago? Uh, that's correct, yeah, he did as well. And, and his, uh, his interpretation of that area was mirrored that of UNESCO um, in saying that it was a World Heritage stature. Would I be right in quoting Bob Pankhurst? I think it was uh, Bob who may have been there. He's pretty much an archaeologist in his own right, isn't he, Tracy, with what he knows about the, the, the Central Coast? But he, he told me quite a few years ago now that Jean Clotz, who's the, the world's foremost authority on petroglyphs, is that right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, to my knowledge it is. And, it, yeah, yeah, Bob Pankhurst does have an enormous amount of knowledge um, of the sites of this area. And I, I might also add to that too, that um, Bob was extremely lucky in his childhood in knowing some of my, um, my ancestors, my family members. Um, and I know that information was shared with him uh, because I know that there's knowledge that Bob knows that I know that I didn't know that Bob knew. <laughs> yeah, and you, can't, you probably can't read it anywhere. No, no, you most definitely cannot read it anywhere. No, you cannot. No, Bob was definitely a, a, a trusted person by our people, and I can say he is, is that is continued on today. We might try and get Bob Heritage listed while we're there. I've been lucky to get a, get out on country with him a, a couple of times, but I think the quote was, Trace, um, that this area has the greatest diversity for rock art to be found anywhere in the world. It was it was, it was something in, in that regard from Jean-Claude, so we'll have to try and 
dig that up from somewhere as as we're looking to try to make this area a national park, which I think is a great outcome as well, and also heritage listed. I mean, it's already listed as a Aboriginal place of significance and known as ca Carry On Sacred Lands. So um, why not go for the national heritage? It would make complete sense. Oh, I, I agree totally. Well, Tracy, it's been really, really wonderful to, to have you on. This is only the second uh, podcast I did. I did one read the, the mountain biking up at uh, Incumber Mountain uh, recently with Joy Cooper. And uh, we're both just kind of finding our feet doing, doing this interview over the phone. I hope for everyone at home that was informative and, uh, and helpful as far as uh, really understanding some of the absolute, um, the gold mine of information that Tracy's got there. Uh, thanks so much again for sharing your stories, uh, Tracy. And, and please, if you want to follow up on any of this, you can jump on Coast Environmental Alliance on Facebook. That's Coast Environment, Environmental Alliance or CEA on Facebook and you can see what we've going on, particularly what we've got going on, particularly around uh, Carry On Sacred Lands at the moment. Tracy, thanks so much for your time. No problem, Jake. Thank you. Thanks a lot.